I'll invite uh, Lisa and Patty and Karen to uh, join us on the panel. Um, and we're going to be uh, talking about um, all of the, the different questions. We received quite a few questions coming through during the session. We also received quite a few questions in the lead up um, through the registration. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through your questions. We've, we're going to take them in themes and we're going to address them in groups because some of your questions are quite similar to each other. Um, and as mentioned, we only have about 45 uh, or so minutes with you uh, for the rest of this evening. So we'll take as many questions as we can. And then any that we're not able to address, we will follow up and share with you in a meeting record. Um, so rest assured that your questions are all important to us and we are going to make sure that you get a response, um, but we may not be able to take all of them live tonight. So we're going to get started and I'm going to invite uh, Patty to just offer a little bit of, uh, just to set the table for us, offer a little bit of clarification around this idea of density. Can you talk a little bit more about what it means when we say 150 people uh, and jobs per hectare? Are we talking about 150 people and 150 jobs? Or how does density get calculated? What does that mean? Um, and then uh, a couple of follow-ups um, around how we come to the idea of what a particular height should be or what a particular density should be for one of the land use designations or for any specific land use designation. Okay, thanks Sarah. So simple answer to the first part is it's, it's 150 people and jobs per hectare combined over. So um, it is not 150 plus 150, so 300, it's 150. And so you could accommodate the you know, meeting that density target by having, you know, 150 people over over one hectare or 75 and 75, that sort of thing is how it, how it works. So, and I would just add, uh, so we had a 126 hectares is approximately how big the area is. And I know we had another question about, you know, how many people are planned. So if you want to meet the minimum density, we're talking about a combination of, a, of about 18,000 people in, in jobs per hectare across the area, 150, sorry, 18,000 people in jobs per uh, across the 126 hectares. Great, thank you. So a couple of follow ups to that. How do you figure out what the density or what the heights should be in order to accommodate those numbers of people for any specific land use de designation, for example, in the mixed use or in the high density residential? Okay. Well, that's uh, a good question. I mean, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. You, you do, you know, start with what you're trying to hit at the top at the top end, you know that the minimum is 150. And so the, the sites have to add up to something that's beyond that as a minimum. Um, and so then, you know, you're looking for, for those opportunities for increased height and density, and you generally, um, you know, begin with an exercise of, of looking a little bit at the market as well about like what the history has been and what the context is or in and around the area to sort of guide what, what you think the maximum should be and, or, or what you, what, what can be achieved. So it's a little bit of that, um, you know, top down approach married with some of the bottom up work and our like public engagement process. We had lots of um, like building exercises with residents and developers to sort of get a sense of what the upper limits could look like and that sort of thing. Um, so all those things informed the draft concept plans that we presented tonight. And Patty, also, um, would you agree that we're also looking at some of the constraints and constraints are in a positive framework as well. We know what the surrounding neighborhoods look like. So we want to make sure then as much as we have the target for in the West Town in the West Urban Center, we know what's adjacent to it, whether it be the rail station, whether it be, you know, Bowmanville Avenue, the higher order roads, you're taking into consideration those as well and putting the appropriate built form adjacent to those. That's right, Lisa. And it is ultimately about your, like all these ingredients, they got to come together to what we talked about in abstract forms being a complete community. They do have to sort of fit together. So there is, maybe that's the part that's a little bit more artful about trying to understand, you know, what the limits are and what can fit uh, in the area based on some of the you know, challenges there. So I agree. So that's a great segue into some of the additional questions that we have around this subject. 
um, related to the tallest buildings and where they go, um, and in particular around the GO station or closest to the GO station, um, how did we arrive at the, the maximum height? Do we feel confident that that's going to help us achieve the intensification targets that are set out at the municipal and at the regional level? Um, and how do we, um, as Lisa was mentioning, how do we start to think about what the implications or impacts might be for um, adjacent properties as well? Well, I mean, the first part here is that uh, we do have a, I mean, we've been using a model um, to test out different um, heights and densities. So we would understand, you know, how it all adds up and how it all fits together. So, you know, confident that the plans we have now will help us achieve the density targets that are set out by the province. Um, the, we're just going into the final phase of sort of consultation and plan preparation. So this is a draft. We would expect to get comments and feedback from others about, you know, what people think is suitable and not suitable and, and would sort of weigh that and consider that as well. Um, so always, yeah, always open for that, for that critical feedback on, on, you know, do we have it right or not? Um, the main thing we we're trying to achieve here, though, is that balance that Lisa talked about, because, you know, there are sites where we do have to achieve a critical mass of height and density, and there are other sites where we need, we want to plan for transitions. So, um, you know, the station isn't in the, the exact middle <laughs> of our area, it's sort of more on the southern edge. So it makes it a challenge to really plan for those transitions as well. So you got to balance that challenge with, uh, with using by using your, your design guidance and, and that sort of thing. Um, to help achieve those, those, those sort of urban design objectives that you also have out there. Okay. And Patty, is it also key that, um, and something you mentioned early on with one of the slides, this is a long-term plan. This is really around the GO station areas, around the major transit station areas. These are 2051 plans. So we're planning for a longer period of time than what we normally plan for. You know, our official plans are normally about 25 years and our secondary plans, but this really is much longer because we're looking at essentially full redevelopment, although we want this to remain as the commercial hub. It's the redevelopment of those parking lots, the infilling of them of new development. And over time, that's going to contribute to the, the densities that we need to achieve. Great, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Patty. Um, okay, so we've got um, a number of questions that are starting to get to um, that element of housing. So we know that housing is a major priority. Um, Patty, could you start us off just talking about the element? So you, you laid out a little bit of the foundation around affordable housing. Could you talk a little bit more about, for example, specific plans? Does the secondary plan go into details around public housing, for example, or how to um, really ensure Sure that there's rental housing stock that comes up as part of future development. Well, I don't. Maybe not the best analogy, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, that you know, a municipality's role here is is setting basically the appropriate menu of what can occur, and um, so the municipality is not providing housing. Um, but they can support it. And so that's what the plan will do. They will, it will support opportunities for affordable housing by doing a couple of things. Uh, it will, uh, it provides the, the sort of the broader suite of permitted uses uh, for mid-rise and high-rise residential. It permits all tenure types. Um, certainly doesn't discourage any forms of affordable housing. In fact, it'll have a policy that encourages opportunities for public and affordable housing. Um, it'll have a framework to incentivize that development as well. And uh, lastly, because um, this area is a major transit station area and in the region's amendment is a protected major transit station area, which is something I didn't talk about in my slides, but we have the ability to um, implement inclusionary zoning here where we can actually, where the municipality can require a certain percentage of housing that is affordable by a developer, but a series of studies and things have to take place before you can do it. There's a very a prescriptive process under the Planning Act to do it that we're not gonna cover in this update, but we it's set up there as a next step should the municipality wish to pursue that piece. So there's a bunch of different ways to try and get there. Okay, and that starts to get us to the idea of um, inclusive communities and communities that are welcoming and that are safe and that are considered um, 
a home and a complete community for everyone. So we have a couple of questions around uh, these elements of inclusive community. So I'll start with one that speaks to residents that are currently there. So um, we do have a couple of specific developments within Bowmanville West that are for seniors and that are uh, for retirees. So when we think about any planning considerations, um, could you talk a little bit about how those elements are brought into the thinking around policy? Um, I'm going to ask Lisa to add to my answer because I may not think of everything on the fly here, but I think the big part, the big enhancement um, here is that so the, the current seniors residence that's right in the heart of the district that permissions and expectations that will be there and continue to be there as a valuable part of the community. The opportunity we have as development occurs is to improve the accessibility for people who want to walk or roll through the area to make the streets environments more safer, more inviting, more for seasonal access. So that's the concept that we, we hope allow to residents of all abilities to move more freely through the area uh, than perhaps they have historically. Um, the um, balance of public spaces on both the north side and the south side is another big opportunity as those public spaces new ones get added or we make improvements to existing ones we also have the opportunity to make them more inclusive and more accessible for people of all ages and abilities um lisa did you want to add to that is there anything I, I, you wanted to add um just the way what the way czar prefaced it and you started it made me go back to some of the original slides that you had spoke of and our original plan way back when, right? In the early 90s, we didn't have the station here, although we were planning for it. And we were putting all the component parts of the complete community. We use that uh, you know, daily as the planners, but all the individual components there. There's the schools, there's the parks, there's the shopping, there's the tr transit. We're gonna hope for a couple of different modes of transit there. Um, we have our community facilities, you know, we have the schools to the north, we have all those parts that make the complete community. So right now, you know, there were a few of those components of the complete community, excuse me, before the seniors residents arrived. And that was the great place to put the seniors right because there's the shopping there, there are the banks there, there are the amenities they need. So it's, it's kind of chicken and egg and the menu and we provide all the component parts. And then like we were always talking about, now we need the developers to come and actually construct all the component parts because us as planners, um, you know, we debated this earlier this week, Patty, we look to the past, we look to the present as well as we look to the future. So we need to plan for all stages, not only of the folks that are gonna be here, but also of the generations that are gonna come. So, thanks. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Patty, for that uh, detail. So there are a couple of uh, tendrils there that I want to pull on because they, they speak to the questions that we're getting around uh, particular elements of public realm design, um, as well as elements of how people will move through the area um, and how kind of the transportation and the mobility elements will be addressed. Um, so let's start with, um, first of all, that aspect of um, mobility and how people get through the area. So um, Karen, we do have a number of questions that are related to um, accessibility and so on. So um, if, could you talk a little bit about uh, just the roadway improvements and the transportation considerations around traffic and how we start to think about an area that's going to be accommodating a lot more people um, in the context of how uh, we plan for everyone to be able to move? Sure, thank you, Zara. Um... Right now, the no road network within the secondary plan is pretty robust. Green Road, Highway 257, Bowmanville Avenue are all arterial roads. Uh, we can include Baseline in there too. Uh, so the, those are the higher, highest order roads. So they're looking up to handling about 40,000 vehicles per day. And then the other surrounding roads, so we're looking at Aspen Springs Drive, West Side Drive, Clarington Boulevard, uh, Prince William. Those are all the collector roads within the secondary plan, and they are meant to handle up to about 5,000 ve uh, vehicles per day. So right now, the system, there is a robust system there for traffic. Now, there's these are, this is looking at ultimate scenarios. So those are, you know, the 40,000, that's an ultimate scenario. 
So right now the traffic is not quite there, but as the traffic moves forward and gets the traffic increases, this the system is uh, monitored and then improvements come on. So some of those improvements were like, for example, we know that 57 is widening to four lanes. So that will be, that will increase the volume significantly. And then Aspen Springs, it's already a very wide road. It has uh, both two lanes of traffic, two lanes of parking, cycling lanes. That allows for some improvements through there. Green Road is another one that right now is at two lanes and you know ultimately it will be widened and that will also take on more traffic. So there's, it's a lot of uh, the same with how the development moves forward, the traffic moves forward with it and so do the improvements. Okay, so let's talk about some of those improvements um, a little bit more specifically because we have a few questions here um, around, for example, um, improvements on Highway 2, for instance. Um, do you have um, particular resources or anywhere that you might point people to be able to get more detailed answers around what the improvements are going to look like, any timelines? How can people stay in touch and make sure that the kind of improvements that they feel are important to the community um, are being developed and that they get an opportunity to provide feedback on those? So Highway 2 and 57 are both regional roads, so I would obviously point them to the region's website for that. So we know again that 57 is going through some improvements. So right now it's it's going to be phased. So right now phase one is the intersection of Highway 2 and 57. And that's going from the CP rail up to Stevens and then just west of uh, 57. And then it's going just east almost, I think it's almost going down to the bridge just before Roanoke. So those are the limits of the first phase, and that's supposed to start this year, and it's approximately an 18-month uh, construction phase. So that will be the first. That'll be the first major one, and then the second phase for 57 is going from baseline up to the CP rail, and that should it's tentatively scheduled to start after phase one is done. The, I do not have any information on improvements for Highway 2. Um, we will be adding a multi-use path to the west side of 57. So that will increase some pedestrian and cycling facilities on there. Uh, right now, we already have existing facilities on Aspen Springs, Green Road. And there is an opportunity to put a multi-use path on the extension of Prince William Drive when it goes out to 57. Okay. Um, okay, so the next element of that that we want to talk a bit more about is um, the neighborhood accesses and how we start to think about um, in a certain sense, protecting neighborhood roads from overflow, from additional parking, all those kinds of things. So could you, could Karen, could you talk a little bit about any tools or tactics that the municipality has to try to make sure that residential streets uh, remain uh, primarily for residential purposes? Yeah, so there's, there's different ways that we can prevent that. So we don't want the, um, we don't want through traffic getting into the residential. So there's different things that we can do where the, you know, for example, where all the streets come out to Aspen Springs, we can put kind of gateways there that uh, don't necessarily invite people to go through into the residential, to the residential area. There's things like that we can do, they're called traffic calming and that prevents from people driving fast through things. So mostly people want to stay on the roads where they can get where they want to go quickly. So that's another way that we can do it. So there's a di there's different options for us to look at. And we're going, as development comes on, these are the different things that we're going to look at and see we want to prevent any kind of, you know, traffic going through the neighborhood, things like that. So then we would, you know, look at options that would prevent or not promote that. Okay. Karen, when we're usually doing our planning and, and Patty's spoken to it as well, and although mostly a built up area, the whole purpose of our collector roads 
um, like you touched on, it gets me to my area from here to here quicker because it's usually a straight path. It's not usually stop signs, a stop, few stop signs, not usually stop lights, but I don't need to go through a neighborhood to get a new location. So particularly when we, uh, you may wanna speak to on the improvements that we saw almost immediately with the underpass in green, at Green Road because people didn't have to cut through neighborhoods. They could use then the higher order roads to be able to drive around the neighborhoods. Sorry, Karen, did you have anything else you wanted to add there? No, I think, I think Lisa hit it on. Okay. Um, okay, so that kind of covers off the main element around uh, mostly people who are, who are driving or using vehicles. So Patty, could you talk a little bit more? Um, we started to talk about the elements around specific uh, routes that are going to be designed for people who are walking or rolling or cycling, as well as um, the idea of making sure that people using all modes are able to reach the GO station. So could you just talk a little bit more about some of those elements around bike lanes? Will they be protected? Will they be separated from traffic? How will we make sure that the design recommendations are aligned with what the community is looking to see? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, first thing I wanted to mention was tonight, you, we did show concept plans or those sort of two-dimensional maps of land use of the public realm improvements, a bit on height and density. Secondary plan will also have one for mobility and transportation. We didn't have it quite ready for this evening, but it will have like the two dimensional map that talks about some of the things Karen was talking about, illustrates where the improvements are planned for and the general nature and character. And similarly, we have one in mind uh, for active transportation improvements that'll distinguish between, you know, those existing cycling lanes and existing bike lanes and, and that are already in place, ones that are planned and ones that are proposed. Uh, the plan won't get into the details of how each street needs to be designed and what the facility would look like on each one. That's going to come through a future uh, process, but what the, the plan does include is 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 some, some of these complete street guidance. So they're, they're sort of flexible and a lot of municipalities have complete street guidelines that they apply that to context, context specific environments. And so that's that's what the plan will have um, to, to guide, I guess, those um, those um, active transportation improvements and, and the character of them, depending on the street type and typology. And in some cases, it's not going to be appropriate to have cycling mixed in with traffic. And in other cases, it might be okay. In other cases, it's going to need to be protected. So, um, so that'll all be spelled out as a in terms of principles to be applied as as the development reoccurs. Okay, um, and the other aspect, um, and um, and Lisa or Karen, feel free to elaborate on this a little bit more, but the other element is transit. So um, Lisa, you mentioned uh, wanting to make sure that there's multiple different elements of transit that are covered. One of those is buses and uh, the regional transit. Um, so in what ways will the municipality be coordinating any transit-oriented improvements to make sure that um, the bus service to the GO station and to the local community um, is improved as uh, the population starts to grow. So we always encourage Durham Transit to be out here. Um, we include, if we go right down to the micro level of at an individual development application, um, while we're doing the site design for individual, while we're doing, while we're commenting on the developer's design for their site, um, if we know there is a transit stop in the area through the site plan approval process, that would be where we would require the installation of um, bus shelters or benches or extra vegetation to be able to provide some shade and, you know, coverage from the elements while people are waiting for the transit stops. So we also, um, with Durham Region Transit, they are included in, as well as Durham Region Planning and Durham Region Works with these secondary plans. So we're always updating them with where the new developments are happening, how quick they're coming on, when the building permits are being, per, um, being issued, so that they're aware of when the new population is arriving in the different areas. So not only do we let them know when the development is happening, but also we include their comments to make sure that when the development actually happens, that all the design elements are included. And this includes um, if we need any bus laybys while Karen's looking at the design of the roads, 
um, placement of buildings to make sure there's, you know, entrances are close to the street that you're not walking, you know, across long parking lots from your street. We're putting the buildings up at the road so it's easier for you to get off your off the bus and then right into your building or writing right into the store or shop. So at each stage of the development, you know, we certainly encourage them and want them out here. It's real. It's not realistic for always us to say bring a bus and bring a bus right now when we don't have any ridership, but we're trying to put all the pieces together so that when the population gets to the point where the bus can be sustained, all the other elements are in place to make it for a more um, comfortable ride for them. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, we did have a request to kind of uh, re uh, show the um, the plan for the area or for uh, the land uses. So I'm just going to pop that up on the screen so that um, uh, Patty, maybe you could take a couple of questions and just speak to uh, some additional details around that. So bear with me here. Okay, so this is the draft land use plan that we have. Um, and so Patty, we did have a couple of questions just wanting to talk a little bit more about height. Um, so first off is um, the overall kind of sense of what are the permitted heights. And so those are kind of indicated on the screen. Could you talk a little bit about uh, as development applications come in, how that starts to get processed or thought of in the context of the secondary plan, are these heights absolutes? Um, in what ways do these heights kind of guide development uh, for the secondary plan area? Well, um, one of the trickiest times to do planning work is, is as development is also occurring. Um, so that's where we're at right now. We have a, a current approved plan for Bowmanville West that's in place. and so. Uh, until this plan we're talking about is um, adopted by council and approved by the region. Um, it's something that an applicant could consider, but ultimately the decisions in, in, the, in Ontario and, and with the um, Ontario Lands Tribunal, the decisions we based on, on the permissions in the current plan that's approved and enforced in effects, so that's the one that applicants today are looking at as their submitting their application. So it can make for a little bit of a messy period while you're trying to transition. So some, it's possible that by the time this plan gets approved um, and in force and effect, we may have a development that doesn't exactly fit the vision we set forth. That's not uncommon, that is, is can happen. Um, but in an ideal world, we'd love the developers to certainly, when we have the draft plan available, to give that rigorous consideration as they submit their applications. And I'm sure council will, will consider the draft policies as well when they make their decisions. Okay, so that's a great uh, point. We actually had a couple of questions about um, the actual development of the secondary plan and the role of Dillon Consulting versus the municipality, as well as the role of the region in terms of uh, proving this plan and what that means. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about all of the different players Parts. that are in the mix here? Sure, so uh, so Dillon Consulting, our planning team, we responded to an RFP uh, back in 2018 or 17, the municipality was looking for some extra bench strength to help them to prepare the plan. So we are provide a little extra horsepower or expertise in this area. We've done um, plans for municipalities across the greater Golden Horseshoe, particularly in areas where uh, communities are transitioning from suburban to more urban. So we've done similar types of plans in Burlington and Vaughan and um, Hamilton and Niagara region and, and sort of the similar challenges and context. But our role was to bring that expertise from other places uh, and provide a little bit of horsepower to Lisa and her team to get the products delivered. Uh, but ultimately staff are the ones who are making, who are, you know, uh, directing us as well on, on how they want the plan to take shape. And we, so we work very collaboratively together to put this stuff together and it'll go to the municipality for uh, adoption. The council will choose to adopt it or amend aspects of it. And then the region is the approval authority. They, uh, um, you know, historically have, have, have had that approval authority. But as we go through this uh, Bill 23 cycle, uh, um, you know, in province or um, 
or the region will be the approval authority, depending on how that all shakes out. Okay, so in that in that context of approving um, both the plan as well as future development, um, when you were speaking about uh, what the intention is around urban design, we often use language around developers will be encouraged to and will be looking to kind of foster an environment where certain things are easier to implement around urban design improvements and um, around the kind of complete community that Lisa was talking about. Um, so could you just talk a little bit more about that implementation aspect of how do we really make sure that the vision gets realized and that the development actually um, comes to fruition in the way that we're hoping for. Um, and when we say we're encouraging developers to do certain things, what does that mean in, the, in terms of the policies? Yeah, it's a, there's a conscious choice in, in language that's used by planners. Uh, so it's um, insightful that folks picked up on that, I suppose, the, the encourage versus require or sort of may or shall, like these are. So in the zoning bylaw is the main legal document that's used, that's enforceable. The plan provides guidance for how the zoning bylaw is to be prepared. So the zoning bylaw very clearly will stipulate the things that are required. And typically the things that municipalities require conformity on are things like building height, building setbacks, building stepbacks, parking standards. These are like measurable and enforceable. Some of the softer stuff that's hard to measure um, are, are things that tend to be encouraged. They're more on the, the design aesthetic side of things. Um, so that's why that language is used and there's the policies provide the guidance and through negotiation and site plan review, the municipalities work through, uh, you know, um, developers are asked to prepare things like urban design briefs to show how their development might address something like, you know, providing appropriate transitions, like what elements did they use? How did they embrace it? That sort of thing. Okay. And I'm Lisa might have a good follow up to that as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. You know, not really a good follow up. The only part <laughs> I was thinking of, and I think maybe I didn't read all the comments that we've got coming in um, about the encouraging, say, of affordable housing. We can't mandate that. We can mandate the built form that only apartment building form is permitted. We can talk to the size of the units in that we would like one bedroom units, two bedroom units, three bedroom units to speak about providing for single single families, you know, a family to be there or a single person to be there. But we wouldn't we would only be able to use language like we encourage in the apartment building form to be rentals or we encourage the townhouses to be rental. We can that's all we can do. We can ask. We can ask politely but we can't demand or write the policy to say, you shall include rental units. You shall include 10% affordable units. It's, it's the other things like, you shall have a five meter side yard setback. There, you know, just as you explained it, Patty, the touchy, the touchy feely type things versus the mandatable things. Okay, so, Excellent points there. And um, I think kind of a, a good segue into another element. So when we look at this map of all of the different types of land uses, we see a lot of it is mixed use and that is supposed to encourage um, that complete community that Lisa has been talking about and that element of uh, community facilities as well as schools and other elements. So schools are a particular issue that has come up a few times in the questions. I'll start with you, Patty, on that uh, aspect. Um, Currently, there um, is an issue with school access. Existing schools are already quite packed uh, in Clarington generally as well. Um, could we talk a little bit more about what the plan is for uh, families that will be coming into the area? How will they be able to get access to um, educational opportunities in schools for their children? It's a, it's a good question. It's a difficult question to answer, but I'll try to do it as, as like honestly as I can. So whether it's um, like all public facilities are packed and in demand, mostly across Ontario, we not enough hospitals, not enough healthcare, school spaces are full, not enough housing, and yet, you know, we continue to have a lot of pressure to grow. So that's the environment we're in, whether we're in Clarington or Hamilton or Waterloo or wherever we may be, we generally find ourselves in a state where it's hard to keep pace with the demand for services while we grow. 
That being said, uh, the responsibility for providing those school spaces is, sits with the school boards. They have a process that they run themselves uh, that, that they try to project how much student, how many students they'll need, where they'll need them, and you know, do the space planning and either identify needs for a new school or do expansions to existing facilities and this kind of thing. But one of the main inputs they need to do that work is to have plans in place and approval. So it's like one of the next steps in getting um, this plan approved is for the school boards to work with this uh, data that'll come out of our plan to consider in their long range um, space planning exercises. Typically secondary plans don't get into a lot of detail around um, the authorities that sit under the Education Act with, with schools and school boards. Okay, Lisa, anything you'd like to add there in terms of coordination with the school boards? Certainly all of our secondary plans include um, both the um, both the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board as well as the Catholic District School Board so that they're aware of where we're planning the neighborhoods. Um, our official plan includes policies on where uh, schools should be located, approximately the size of the school blocks, the road network around the schools. So we put the land use planning in place for where the schools can be located, how they get, how they are incorporated in the neighborhood, how the neighborhood is developed all the way around them. But similar to bringing a development, um, you know, for a 12 story building or a 25 story building, it is up to the school board to actually deliver the school. We can only provide for the framework around. And certainly we try and include the school boards at every step of the planning process. Like I say, we, you know, we've got 11 secondary plans ongoing right now. We have conversations weekly with the two school boards and where necessary the additional school boards so that they know where the population is going to be and we try and make sure we're accommodating the, the schools but like Patty said it is up to the other levels of government to actually deliver on those um, those built form products. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you, Patty. Um, okay, so we do have the other element um, or another element around um, complete communities, um, which uh, Patty, you talked a bit about the parks and the recreation spaces. Um, can we talk a little bit more about how we make sure that there is enough park space for everyone? Some of the questions and the concerns we're hearing um, in the questions is that there's not much park space south of Highway 2, um, at least in terms of the amount of green that you can see on the map. So how does additional uh, recreational space or community space get in integrated into some of these mixed use areas and into the plan? Um, and then when we're thinking about the design of those parks, um, what are the elements around um, uh, safety, for example, um, that are being thought about in order to make sure that uh, there's good access and that the design of those uh, spaces themselves is really thinking about all the different people in the community? Okay, I will start and maybe Lisa can add to this. Um couple things here. Uh, one is that uh, the space planning standards have changed under Bill 23. So we do have a little bit more work to do before we um, finish up a draft secondary plan and release it for. And one of those areas we needed to revisit was just to that point to make sure we have adequate amount of uh, dedicated park space that we're permitted to under the Planning Act in terms of standards. Now, that being said, we, we, when we originally came up with the concept plan, we were looking at both the lands within the study area, but also lands within walking distance of the study area that users would be expected to use because there is a network of parks and public spaces um, beyond the plan area as well as in here. And the second thing is while the land use plan is showing sort of three distinct um, elements, there is the linear corridors as well as the series of um, you know, public space improvements in terms of the, the public realm as well, uh, that we're, so the whole network is sort of working together. And uh, when we did do the draft at the time, it, it, it seemed to sort of meet the standard, but we do wanna go back and, and check and make sure we've got the right, the right amount um, allocated because uh, it's basically the only way these things do get built is to get it right when you do it the first time. Uh, and Lisa, I yeah. don't know if you wanted to add to that and maybe talk a bit about the design components as well, or? Um, we like, 
we are going to embark into a parks planning um, process as part of the official plan review. Um, the only thing that I would add perhaps is, yes, there's all these parks and we certainly have to revisit with the changes in the provincial legislation, but also to the number of spaces um, that we had presented, there will be publicly accessible private spaces that would contribute to sort of the recreation and the um, space that you can use for outdoor enjoyment and not just the traditional park. Like for example, the space at the corner, northeast corner of Green Road and Highway 2, there is an open plaza there, plaza with seating. Um, it's for reference, not to promote any one business, it's right there next to the St. Louis Bar and Grill across the road from Finns. There is an open space there. So that isn't a neighborhood park. It isn't a parkette but it is a publicly accessible open space that people use to recreate and enjoy the outdoors. So in addition to all of these green spaces, there's also going to be the you know, private amenity space for the higher density and medium density blocks, plus the other ones in the commercial areas. Okay. Um... So we have a, a vision for a community that's going to have parks in it. It's going to have uh, libraries, schools, potentially in the future, all of these kinds of things. Um, Patty and Lisa, I'll let you decide who goes first here. Could we talk a little bit about funding? How, where does the money come from to pay for all of the amenities? How do we make sure that there is the funding available uh, to be able to make sure that these things get realized? Um, and then in that vein, also starting to think about um, the opportunities for people to continue to participate and continue to uh, provide feedback as the secondary plan gets implemented in future stages. Take a stab at that. Uh, the municipalities have some tools in the um, Planning Act and in the Development Charges Act to, to sort of collect either money to fund new infrastructure associated with growth. Um, that's under the Development Charges Act. So that's what would fund improvements here. Um, it also has the ability to um, take land as development applications come forward up to a certain amount or to take fund like cash uh, in lieu of the land where it makes sense to, you know, again, fund maybe a more central park space. Um, that's the kind of general framework. There are the tools there. Again, the rules that just changed on all the amounts and things like that, but that's like where the implementation policies come into play as they explain that component of how these things are expected to work. Um, so um, there are 10, like one of the hardest things that's taken me years to kind of figure out as a younger planner was like how all the plans work together. So there are tendrils and they all have to be connected. Uh, so we do this secondary plan, at least alluded to the you know, citywide parks and recs plan. Like this provides guidance to the citywide one uh, that can then inform this particular plan, the development charges study that they do every 10 years for their capital planning. Like this work informs that work so that when the city's doing its development charges that they are collecting money for the infrastructure needed to, to fund the growth in this area. At least I don't know if there's any different no, you, angle or anything else. No, right. you covered that, Patty. Perhaps the only thing that maybe is not included there is once we receive the land from the developers or have purchased the land, um, then it's, it, the municipality is the one that puts the structures on top of the land. So we would put the... Um, um, you know, put the lot, tot lot there, or build the baseball diamonds. That is, um, that's something the municipality um, looks after. So Lisa, we do have a follow-up on that. And um, could you talk a little bit about those revenue streams for the funding? Um, so are we talking about property taxes? Are we talking about other ways to fund uh, infrastructure? And then also um, adjacent to that, when we think about does the existing infrastructure have enough capacity to support growth? So around sewer and water, how do we plan to make sure that overall infrastructure is being upgraded and designed uh, accordingly as, as growth happens? Uh, Patty, I'm going to, if you want to jump in on parts of this, so multiple uh, funding streams, but certainly the tax base. So um, municipal, municipal taxes, go um, partially to fund some of these. 
as well um, through the development process when the developer is constructing perhaps um, a new plan of subdivision, they are required to install the roads. So it is a, a developer funded, the developer is constructing the roads. Um, Karen, correct me, um, when the road needs to be upsized or it's a larger size road, it is a joint venture then between the municipality pays portions of it and the developer pays the other portions of it. Um, but planning for infrastructure, Karen, I'm going to ask you to take that one to make sure it's a, the planner version versus the engineer version. So I think the engineer version is appropriate here. Thanks, Lisa. So I uh, already said previously in the presentation, the region has confirmed capacity. So that will play a part in determining the number of units that can go through the secondary plan. So the region takes care of both sanitary and water, and they would have confirmed for both. Stormwater is a little bit different, uh, whereas this, as sites develop, they are responsible for their own stormwater management. So they would install things on site that would control their storm to uh, the allotments that are given through our existing storm system. Okay, thank you, Karen um, and Lisa for that elaboration. Um, we do have a number of questions that start to actually ask about specific sites. So development applications for specific sites um, re related to how tall those buildings are going to be, um, related to, for example, um, any trees that might be cut down, that type of thing. Um, could we, uh, Patty, just talk a little bit about the specific development applications, what uh, the overview might be, um, and where people can go, uh, Lisa, to just make sure that if they have questions about a particular property or particular site, um, that they know where to uh, address those types of questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, earlier when I was talking about this, the idea was that, you know, if there's an application already in process, it's, it's the current Bowmanville West secondary plan, the current zoning bylaw that are used to, to the staff used to make decisions and recommendations on. Um, and then so uh, this can be something that's considered once we have a draft plan released, but it, it, it's not doesn't have carry as much weight as those currently approved plans. And Lisa might want to speak more about the logistics of like, you want to know more about application X, Y, or Z. Okay. So the, um, the one slides are that you had up with our contact information. You can certainly send any emails to myself. However, um, you could also use the Bowmanville West at clarington.net. Um, there are multiple staff that are receiving those emails. So any of your inquiries, perhaps if it's, um, um, likely the interesting one, uh, 10 Aspen Springs or some other ones in the area, you can just send your inquiry to that email address. Um, there's also information on the website about that project, but I would say either direct it to myself, lbacchus at clarington.net, it is on that slide, or at the Bowmanville West at clarington.net, and we'll distribute those um, to the particular planner on the file. Um, and then we can provide any responses necessary um, to the questions that are being provided. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so we're just about at 8.30 p.m. Um, we do have quite a few more questions that we weren't able to get to tonight. Um, as mentioned, we will be creating a pro a meeting record that will have all the questions that we received as part of the registration, as well as tonight, any questions that we weren't able to answer will be part of that record and we'll be making sure that um, we provide that to you so you'll be able to get a hold of it on the project website. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, if you would like updates, please make sure that you subscribe by email on the website um, so that you will uh, get a notification when new information is posted. Um, but we are looking forward to your participation and your involvement in the next steps. So just a reminder of that, um, that we do have a statutory public meeting that will be coming up uh, later on um, 
in the early summer uh, prior to the summer recess um, and that we hope you will continue to stay engaged. We love to see a community that cares so much and wants to be involved and wants to participate in decision making um, and we continue to welcome your comments and uh, all of the feedback that you have to try to make sure that this plan is designed to truly meet the community's needs now and into the future. Um, so on behalf of myself and the entire team, we want to thank you so, so much for being with us this evening. Um, and I'll just hand it over to Lisa to say a few words um, and close us out for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zara. Thank you, Patty, uh, Karen, and the other staff on the call. And most of all, thank you to all of you for spending your evening with us and providing um, your questions and your comments and your feedback. Um, all the comments that we receive um, help us to make a better plan and to ensure that we're planning for um, what our community wants, right? We want to hear from you. And we then want to hear from our council. We also, as you heard, we need to, we've heard from the province. They've told us what kind of densities we're looking for. So this is our task to try and balance all of those needs and put forward the best plan we can for the Bowmanville West. So we certainly appreciate you spending your time with us tonight. And we definitely look forward and encourage you to participate um, through the statutory public meeting process before summer. And thank you so very much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Take you. care.